the name of the rose by Umberto Eco read by Evere our Turs in which Adso in the scriptorium reflects on the history of his order and on the destiny of books I came out of the church less tired but with my mind confused the body does not enjoy peaceful rest except in the night hours I went up to the scriptorium and, after obtaining Malachi's permission, began to leaf through the catalogue, but as I glanced absently at the pages passing before my eyes, I was really observing the monks. I was struck by their calm, their serenity. Intent on their work, they seemed to forget that one of their brothers was being anxiously sought throughout the grounds, and that two others had disappeared in frightful circumstances. Here, I said to myself, is the greatness of our order. For centuries and centuries, men like these have seen the barbarian hordes burst in, sack their abbeys, plunge kingdoms into chasms of fire. And yet they have gone on, cherishing parchments and inks, have continued to read, moving their lips over words that have been handed down through centuries and which they will hand down to the centuries to come. They went on reading and copying as the millennium approached. Why should they not continue to do so now? The day before, Benno had said that he would be prepared to sin in order to procure a rare book. He was not lying, and not joking. A monk should surely love his books with humility, wishing their good and not the glory of his own curiosity. But what the temptation of adultery is for the layman and the yearning for the riches is for the secular ecclesiastics, the seduction of knowledge is for monks. I leafed through the catalogue, and the feast of mysterious titles danced before my eyes. Quinti sereni di medicamentis, fe nomina, liber e sopi, li natura animalium, liber e biti, peronimi di cosmografia, libri tres quos arcufas episcopas da namo, esipienti de locis sunkis, otra marinis, Designavit conscribendos. Libellis Q. Iuli Hilarionis di origin mundi. Solini polibisto di situ orbis. Terrarium et mirabilis el majestbas. I was not surprised that the mystery of the crimes should involve the library. For these men devoted to writing, the library was at once the celestial Jerusalem and an underground world on the border between Terra Incognita and Hades. They were dominated by the library, by its promises and by its prohibitions. They lived with it, for it, and perhaps against it, sinfully hoping one day to violate all its secrets. Why should they not have risked death to satisfy a curiosity of their minds, or have killed to prevent someone from appropriating a jealously guarded secret of their own? Temptations, to be sure, intellectual pride. Quite different was the scribe monk imagined by our sainted founder, capable of copying without understanding, surrendered to the will of God, writing as if praying and praying inasmuch as he was writing. Why was it no longer so? Oh, this was surely not the only degeneration of our order. It had become too powerful. Its abbots competed with kings and abbo, did I not perhaps have the example of a monarch who, with monarch's demeanor, tried to settle controversies between monarchs? The very knowledge that the abbeys had accumulated was now used as to barter goods, calls for pride, motive for boasting and prestige. Just as knights displayed armor and standards, our abbots displayed illuminated manuscripts. And all the more so now, what madness, when our monasteries had also lost leadership and learning. Cathedral schools, urban corporations, universities were copying books, perhaps more and better than we, and producing new ones. And this may have been the cause of many misfortunes. The abbey where I was staying was probably the last to most of excellence in the production and reproduction of learning. But perhaps for this very reason, the monks were no longer content with the holy work of copying. They also wanted to produce new complements of nature, compelled by lust for novelty. And they did not realize, as I had sensed vaguely at the moment, and know clearly today, now aged in years and experience, that in doing so, they sanctioned the destruction of their excellence. Because if this new learning they wanted to produce were to circulate freely, outside those walls, 
that nothing would distinguish that sacred place any longer from cathedral, school, or city university. Remaining isolated, on the other hand, it maintained its prestige and its strength intact. It was not corrupted by disputation, by the cool libidical conceit that would every subject, every mystery, and every greatness to the scrutiny of the sick etno. There, I said to myself, are the reasons for the silence and the darkness that surround the library. It is the preserve of learning, but can maintain this learning unsullied only if it prevents its reaching anyone at all, even the monks themselves. Learning is not like a coin, which remains physically whole even though, through its most infamous transactions, it is rather like a very handsome dress, which is worn through use and ostentation. Is not a book like that, in fact? Its pages crumble, its ink and gold turn dull, if too many hands touch it. I saw Pacificus of Tivoli leafing through an ancient volume whose pages had become stuck together. Because of the humidity, he moistened his thumb and forefinger with his tongue to leaf through the book, and every touch of his saliva, those pages lost vigor, opening them meant folding them, exposing them to the harsh of air and dust, which had eroded the subtle wrinkles of the parchment and produced mildew where the saliva had softened but also weakened the corner of the page. As an excess of sweetness makes the warrior flaccid and inept, this excess of possessive and curious love would make the book vulnerable to the disease destined to kill it. What should be done? Stop reading and only preserve? Were my fears correct? What would my master have said? Nearby, I saw a rubricator, Magnus of Iona, who had finished scraping his vellum with pumice stone and was now softening it with chalk, soon to smooth the surface with a ruler. Another, next to him, Rubano of Toledo had fixed the parchment to the desk, pricking the margins with tiny holes on both sides, between which, with a metal stylus, he was now drawing very fine horizontal lines. Soon the two pages would be filled with colors and shapes, a sheet that would become a kind of reliquary, glowing with gems studying what would then be the devout text of the writing. Those two brothers, I said to myself, are living their hours of paradise on earth. They were producing new books, just like those that time would inexorably destroy. Therefore, the library should, could not be threatened by any earthly force. It was a living thing. But if it was living, why should it not be open to the risk of knowledge? Was this what Benno wanted, and what Venentius perhaps had wanted? I felt confused afraid of my own thoughts. Perhaps they were not fitting for a novice, who should only follow the rules scrupulously and humbly through the years to come, which is what I subsequently did, without asking myself further questions. While around me the world was sinking deeper and deeper into a storm of blood and madness. It was the hour of our morning meal. I went to the kitchen, where by now I had become a friend of the cooks, and they gave me some of the best morsels. 